Let me welcome you to the uh, second lecture uh, of this lecture series for this academic year. And uh, uh, before I uh, introduce our speaker for today, let me mention that uh, uh, on uh, October the 6th, uh, we have a speaker uh, again uh, from, uh, uh, um, from uh, Ajlan Technology. In fact, we had one last year, last uh, two weeks ago by the name of uh, Mr. Roger Stancliffe. He is uh, the CTO, the uh, Chief Technical Officer uh, for the Microwave Measurement Component uh, Test Division in uh, Santa Rosa. And uh, the title of his talk is uh, Beyond Electronics, Exploring Microwave Measurement Applications in the Life Sciences and the Nano Scale. It's going to be an interesting one. Uh, for today, uh, you have, uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, talk uh, titled uh, Low Power CMOS Circuits for Biomedical Applications. And the speaker uh, uh, for today is uh, Dr. Jack uh, O, who is, uh, has recently joined the department, our department, that is the engineering science uh, um, uh, department. And, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what, uh, let me just give you a little bio about him. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jack uh, uh, O received his uh, Bachelor of Science, uh, Master of Science and uh, PhD degrees in Electrical Engineering from Rutgers University in Piscataway, New Jersey in uh, 1999, 2009 and 2005 respectively. Between uh, 2005 and 2007, he was uh, with IBM where he developed wireless CMOS receivers. He was with uh, Lyric Semiconductor in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2008 where he, he was uh, engaged in the design of uh, uh, probabilistic circuits. From 2009 to 2011, he was the, an assistant professor with uh, Fitchburg State University in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. He is currently an assistant professor with the Department of Engineering Science, uh, the Sonoma State University. His research interests are in the area of analog uh, um, RF integrated circuit design with a special uh, uh, emphasis on uh, biomedical applications. So here is Dr. Uh, o. Let's give him a call. I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Kojuri for his introduction. Um, the title of today's talk is Low Power uh, CMOS for Biomedical Applications. So I first thought, uh, thought about this topic about 10 years ago when I was a doctor student at a startup company. And one day we gathered around the lunch table and somebody started to ask, you know, ask this question, right, how do I start a startup company? What are the some ingredients I need in order to uh, start a company? And we talked a lot about you know, that day about how to start a company, and I think just about the only two things I remember from that day were with, the, with this. The first, the first thing you need to have is an interesting idea, and the second you need to have is to have access to this technology which is mature and which, which, which can be obtained relatively cheap. So, and some of you attended the talk that uh, John gave, John from Agilent gave two weeks ago about um, about cellular uh, wireless uh, communications. And one of the things that he began to talk about at the end was sort of this integration, this, this, uh, this push towards uh, integrating as many systems on a single die, right? And one of the problem, and I started saw this a few years ago uh, when I was at IBM, and one of the reasons that, um, that, you know, that's, that makes it so hard for a small company to compete with you know, big companies such as Qualcomm or Broadcom nowadays is because your customers are asking you to deliver you know, what, what's called the integrated solutions to their problems. And, and he started talking about, remember last time he talked talk about how you need to have different cell, uh, cell phone standards integrated on the same chip in order to, uh, to make the phone work at different, you know, regardless of where they go. So, and, and we, so, so that in a way ties into to my talk today because 
when I went to this conference uh, called IS, ISCC two years ago, and actually three, three years ago, and I just started to discover that it's almost impossible to compete with these companies uh, because they're extremely good at what they do. And, 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 you, and so why not, you know, instead of competing with the, these big companies, you know, people in the universities and in the industry really have to find different applications where uh, they can, uh, where they can also be good at what they do. And one of the reasons it's so difficult to compete with big uh, companies like Qualcomm or Broadcom nowadays is because the transistors that we use are so are so expensive. Here is a slide that here's a, a table uh, consists of numbers that I, co I collected from the web. And basically, it gives you a sense of how, how, uh, how much it will cost you to have access to, um, uh, to you know, the submicron CMOS processes. And what I want to highlight, I have more data on TSMC, which is this company located in Taiwan. And their specialty is, is in the manufacturing of, uh, of um, circuit uh, IC chips for companies. And if you look at the numbers, that, how much they charge, for a die, which is uh, five millimeter times five millimeters, if you're interested in 0.35 technology, uh, which is about the technology people use probably 15 years ago, you pay about $8,500. Now, if you're interested, if you want to use probably the latest technology available to most companies, for a die as small as 3.5 millimeter times 3.5 millimeters, you pay $100,000. You know, that, this is not something that you could easily afford in the academic or in the, uh, or in the industry. And if you, this is a, a chip that was, uh, that was uh, uh, published in a paper submitted to ISCC by Qualcomm this year. And this uh, particular chip includes several cell cellular phone standards. And what I want, you know, I did a quick as cost estimation of this chip. If you assume that the per millimeter cost uh, for, the, uh, for this particular technology, which is 65 nanometer CMOS, is $8,400. You multiply, you multiply that number by the size of the chip, the number you get is $440,000. Uh, $440, this is how much it costs just to produce a test chip, a test shuttle. And I think this is a pretty reasonable number because, you know, when I was at the startup companies a couple years ago, this is, our chip wasn't as big, but this is right in the, uh, in the ballpark of how, how much we pay for our test shows. So what that means is if you're starting a company, you probably have to have a few million dollars a year just, you know, just to support your engineering st staff as well as your engineering uh, design activities. But let's look at biomedical, um, bio biomedical applications. And, some of the papers that people have published in the biomedical world. This is a paper public, published by people at Medtronic. So they were working on a chip that would allow um, uh, the detection of a wave called alpha wave, which can, be, uh, which can be extracted from the surface of your brain. And so they published this. You know, the idea is that if you can somehow detect this, this particular wave, then you can tell how people think. And you can use that to turn, uh, turn on lights without, uh, without touching anything. So they were able to do this chip on a 0.8 micron CMOS process, which was probably the technology that people used 20 years ago. And, and I think this particular chip fits both the criteria that people were talking about at that lunch meeting a long time ago, namely that it has an interesting application. It also uses a process which is affordable. So what about people in the university world, right? uh, in, in the academics? Well, fortunately for people who work in the academics, uh, Moses, which is a company that provides fabrication services for <coughs> uh, universities in, in the US. So they provide free uh, test shuttles uh, for the following processes. Um, so what I'm most excited about is the point 0.1a microns. CMOS uh, by IBM because, because this is exactly the shuttle that we used when I was, at, was at, at the startup company two years ago. And, and you really can do a lot with, with that technology. 
And we'll, we'll show in a few slides why that's the case. So, so, so the practical implication for people who work in academia is this. Whenever you start a project, you have to think about, you have to choose your project carefully. Uh, two weeks ago, you know, John talked about the 60 gigahertz, uh, the receiver, the transmitter that some people were designing. You can't quite do, you know, do six, a 60 gigahertz chip with po in 0.18 microns because the transistors are not simply fast enough. So when you start a, when you start a you know, project, you have to think about what you really can do with the process you have. You, ha you also have to learn to design your circuits very carefully because it is you know, different from a software project which, uh, where you can upload and update right, three months later. You can't quite do it with, um, uh, with a hardware design project. If you, it, it, let's say you design a uh, wireless receiver, it takes on an average probably a year to a year and a half to finish to design your chip. After you design the chip, you send it off to maybe, I don't know, maybe if, you send, if, you're, if your foundry is IBM, then you send it off to Vermont. If your foundry is uh, TSMC, then you send it off to Taiwan. You wait three months before you get your chip back. So, so what that means is from the time you design your chip and from the time you test chip, uh, you easily have to wait about uh, probably 18 months to, to, 20 or to 24 months. What that means is you have to, so what that means is you have to design your chip very carefully you, because if you don't, it will take you literally a year to a year and a half to discover that you've made a mistake. And that's what's really difficult about chip design nowadays. And also, in addition to the cost, if you're paying for the test shuttle. So, so today, so that's my introduction. Today, I'm, I'm going to talk about biomedical sensors. And there's really a lot to talk about. So what I'd like to do, focus today are three papers that represent different ways that sensors operate. The first sensor I'm going to talk about uses a technique called voltage de detection. And the second uses a technique called current detection. And I'll try to give an example of each as we move on. And then finally, the third technique uses uh, complex impedance detection. So let me talk about the first uh, te the technique, uh, the biosensor technique, which, is use, which uses voltage detection. And an example I can give you is the EKG circuit. Right? This is a circuit that you can even build it at home. So it basically measures um, the waveform of your heart rate. What are the requirements of um, sensors that, um, that uh, uses voltage detection? One of the requirements you have, one of the requirements that you have to have good common rejection ratio, which is basically how well you can reject your noise. This is a plot of the 60 hertz noise that you can pick up from, uh, on your body. And I <coughs> obtained this pop, uh, plot by simply putting my hand at the input of a uh, oscilloscope. And you actually can measure quite a bit of uh, voltage um, um, when you uh, put your hand in, on that uh, oscilloscope, oscilloscope that way. So this is the signal that you have to, uh, you have to reject. So that's one property that's really important to uh, an EK, EKG circuit. Another property is that you have to have a circuit that's sensitive enough. In addition to this noise, which is from the environment, circuits also generate a, a noise called 1, 1 over F noise, which I will talk about later um, in the talk. The second category of biosensors is based on current detection. And an example I can give you is um, circuit called pulse oximeter, which is a, um, a medical device used by doctors to sense the level of oxygen in your blood. So the idea is, is this. You shine an LED light through your finger, and you try to monitor the absorption of, of the light on the other side of the fingers. So, so the idea is that when the blood is well oxygenated, it doesn't absorb the uh, the red light as well, and when you have a blood that's deoxygenated, that means uh, it, which means it doesn't have as much oxygen, then then the the, the, the red light tends to be absorbed a little bit better. So by by detect by um, trying to figure out how much uh, the light is absorbed, uh, you can uh, tell how much uh, 
the, ex the, the level oxygen level in your blood. And this, is, and this particular vital sign was used by doctors to diagnose a variety of problems. This is a, uh, probably the most power efficient uh, wrist oximeter that, that's currently available in the market. And several things worthwhile noting about this particular oximeter. First is the price. Are you going to pay $700 for a device like this? Probably not. And you can see why people are, you know, my wife, my wife works in the hospital. And she was telling me, you know, we have to, we've had this device for a long time. Why are you interested in this, this particular device? You know, we, we always have a box in the room that we can use it um, to measure the oxygen level. Well, first of all, you know, you don't necessarily, with a push, uh, to sort of move patients from the hospitals to, uh, to, to their own homes, you, ne you don't necessarily want to have all your equipment in the hospital because it, uh, it costs so much more money to keep patients in the hospital. So the trend now is to have patients do, um, to care for themselves at their home. And, and, and that's sort of one, one, uh, one way that hospitals are doing nowadays to reduce their cost. And one of the, uh, and, and, and where this particular piece of equipment comes in is it allows, um, it gives the patients the ability to monitor a key vital signs at home. But another piece, and obviously the cost, you know, if you were to sort of put this, right, in people's home, then you somehow have to reduce the price a little bit. It's way too expensive right now. If you look at what they advertise here, right, what they're basically saying is that the battery will, la will last for 24 hours. That's way too short. You know, you, I mean, who's, imagine, you know, having this 80-year-old grandma at home, you know, are you really gonna ask her to replace the battery, you know, in 24 hours? Probably not. So, so the challenge is to develop a low power device that can, um, that doesn't consume as much um, current and therefore allows the device to be operated over a longer time, longer period of time. So the issue with the current detection is that it has to be extremely sensitive to current because what you're doing is you're trying to detect uh, the, uh, the light um, produced by the photoreceptor, uh, the, the photosensors, which can produce a, a very a low level current and somehow you have to detect that photo current. The third type of sensor, which is used quite a bit in biomedication, biomedical applications is called uh, the, the sensors that use impedance detection, they work very similar, similar uh, they, they show a lot of similarity with impedance uh, analyzer we have in the lab, but they work a little bit differently. So the similarity is in the sense that both devices measure the small changes in impedance. But what people use instead is to build the, so the rationale of this is to Complicate, uh, replace complicated bulky equipments with something that's more portable, something that can be deployed uh, to measure thousands of um, samples in a very short amount of time. But how do you do that on today's CMOS, right? Well, one way you can do that is, is this. So this is a metal stack, sort of the vertical view of uh, the CMOS process we're using today. And you build your transistor over here. Right. In this particular process, uh, we have several ways to get the signal out. This is the first metal layer, second metal layer, third metal layer, and the fourth metal layer. And the, the metal layers are connected by vias, the vertical vias. And you build your devices down here. And we have ways of making openings because we do have to make pa I.O. pads on, this, on, the, on, the, on the chip so that the chip can talk to the world. So one, one way we can do that is by uh, by, have, uh, by having passivation openings on top of the chip. A problem that people have is, is that the top layer of the met of the, uh, of this, uh, of in this process is made of aluminum, which doesn't interact particularly well when you put it in a, in a chemical solution. So what people have to do instead is to deposit a, nickel, a, a thin nickel layer on top of the aluminum so that they can put gold on top of it. And the idea is that if you do that, you can, 
get, um, you can put these um, linker, or linker molecules or capturing probes on top of the aluminum, um, I'm sorry, on top of the gold layer, because the gold, can, in this particular example, the gold can form covalent bond with sulfur, which can, you know, which can be part of the DNA molecule, for example. So the idea is this. You have these, um, these capturing probes on top of, on top of your CMOS process, right? And we're, see, we're showing the view all the, so what we're looking at is basically this area here. So you have these probes. Uh, in the, and the idea is that you, you have this, you know, you put, um, you put this chemical solution which contains uh, molecules that you want to detect, right? And the idea is that when the molecule is attached to these probes, it changes uh, the, the resistance, the capacitance of, of the interface over here, which means that if you try to measure the impedance, right, of, of uh, the interface here, you can detect that. Here's an example of that uh, at time uh, as uh, time instant equals. Uh, in the in, in in the first time instant, you don't have anything attached to the electrolyte, and you measure a specific um, value for the resistance, the capacitors here. And at time instant number two, you have molecules attached to the probes, and that changes and that changes the R and the C of the circuit. And what that means is the impedance will change. So if you drop, if you put chemical solutions um, on top of on top of the uh, your sensor, you can measure different you know, the, the concentration of the solution. In this particular example, you can also tell whether the DNA. So the DNA really has two strains, right? And and in this case, you can tell the difference between single in single stranded DNA and double stranded DNA. So the way you do it is with a circuit called, uh, that looks very, very much similar to the wireless receiver I used to design. What you have here is the, uh, a, direction, a direct conversion uh, architecture. So the idea is this. You excite your chemical solution with a voltage source. And you basically do it, this, this, uh, extract the impedance the same way that you would supply a test voltage and calculate the test current in electronics too, in order to calculate the impedance. You do the same thing here. You apply a, a voltage to excite um, the, the, the chemical solution, and you try to measure the current and calculate the, calculate the impedance. And we'll talk about that in, in a few slides from now. So you know, all this sounds like science, science fiction, right? And, and it seems like you, know, you, you might be wondering, how come you know, what's so hard about designing these circuits. So next, what I'd like to talk about is the challenges that you're gonna run into when you try to design some of these circuits yourself. Usually, you can characterize a circuit by its power, speed, gain, noise, linearity, and mismatch. And the first parameter that I, that I would like to talk about is power dissipation of a circuit. So, so what, what we have here is is a common source uh, amplifier, which uh, if, you're, if you're taking electronics two with me, this is, a, this is what you, lear you, lear you learn on the first day of class. So what you have here is a, a voltage uh, uh, driving, uh, a voltage source driving a current source, uh, I'm sorry, a common source amplifier. If you can neglect the resistance of this transistor, then, base, you can, then you can calculate the gain of this amplifier, which is roughly equal to the transconductance of this, uh, this tra trans uh, transistor multiplied by the low resistor. And the idea I want, to I want to talk about is this. By the current density right, uh, of this transistor is it's governed by this equation here. And the challenge is this, right? The challenge is always to design your circuit with as little current as possible. So, so if we want to understand the lim design limitation, the power limitation of this particular circuit, then we have to fix our gain 
at, at a constant level while trying to minimize this, the current. So if you do that, what you're going to find out is that you can't change your GM because your gain is determined by your GM times the low resistance. So what you have here is essentially fixed. And the only way you can play around with the power is to ch uh, play with the current density. And the only way you can change, lower the power is by reducing the current density, which means you need to reduce your GM over I ratio. So what's the problem with that? Well, well, here is a plot of current density versus GM over ID of a typical transistor in 0.13 uh, micron process. So, so the idea is that as you push, as you increase right, um, your GM over ID ratio by minimizing the current, you move your the region of your operation to the right. So, so some of these regions may not be familiar to you. In electronics too, we talked about designing an amplifier in a saturation region. So the saturation is somewhere out here. And, right, and they tend to be a little bit more power hungry. So what we're saying with this slide is that in order to minimize power, we need to be out here in the moderate a moderate inversion and subthreshold region of the transistor. So there are two problems with that. Some of and and one of them is still true. The other one is not so relevant anymore. The the price you pay for having a transistor bias at our low current density is that you need to have uh, consume. Uh, you need to have a large W over L ratio for the transistor, which can be a problem when you have a transistor that doesn't look like a transistor anymore, right? Uh, I looked at some of these biomedical engineering, biomed uh, circuits de uh, developed for biomedical applications. Some of these devices are huge. You know, you, you, you're easily talking about a device that's 200 microns divided by two, uh, two microns, which means you have a width, uh, which is about 200 uh, microns, and a length, which is about two microns. That's that's quite a bit of an area. So that's the price that you have to pay. What about speed? In the old days, um, this is probably 15 years ago, devices were not as good. So when you have a device that, that large, basically you have a device that generates a lot of parasitics. Uh, what I mean by that is you have a device that look, look more and more like a capacitor and a resistor. And that can have quite a bit of implications when you want to push that device to operate uh, in a high frequency um, uh, uh, application. So, so here is a, here's the schematic that I took from the, um, the EKG paper that I showed earlier. So, and their, part of their trick was to push the device all the way into a substantial <coughs> region. And the result of that was they were able to get this EKG circuit to work at less than, uh, I believe, three microwatts of power. And that's extremely low power. And overall, the, I think they, they were aiming to build this, um, this uh, EKG circuit that could uh, basically obtain its power from the environment and, and can, uh, can extract this, uh, the, this, the heart rate with this circuit and and, and convert it into a digital format with with another low power ADC. This is another. This is a circuit that was part of the pulse oximeter that I showed you a little bit earlier. They're pushing this device into the subthreshold region, not necessarily to save power, but in this case, to implement to get a logarithmic uh, to to have a device that can um, have a wider range of sensitivity. And by doing that, they were able to eliminate, change their circuit, circuit architectures and be more effective, be, be more um, effective with their, uh, with their, uh, their uh, power budget. So, so what really amazes me is the way they were able to do it. They, they were able, able to implement oximeter circuit with, um, with, uh, with so little power. So basically, by doing that, they were able to save a lot of power in their trans impedance amplifier. 
And if you compare the power, they, so, so what you have here in the first row is the power that's required to turn on the LED. And I think that remains to be, that problem remains to be solved because you know, it takes quite a bit of power to turn on the LEDs. So that's sort of the bottleneck at this point. If you remember the, the commercial oximeter uh, circuit that I showed in the beginning, um, that particular circuit uh, consumes about 55 milliwatts of power, which means if you were to uh, uh, run it with four AAA batteries, it will take about, it, it will only last for about five days. On the, on the other hand, they have a 10x improvement in power. As a result, it lasts a bit longer. So, so the trouble with pushing a device in a subthreshold region is that they become a little bit bigger, which means they don't work so well at high frequencies. In the old days, this was the case, but is it still the case today? Well, FT is, is a parameter that tells you how fast you can operate a transistor. If you want to have a circuit that, um, that operate at a certain frequency, let's say one gigahertz, for example, you want to make sure that this FT of your device is, is at least 10 times or maybe 20 times higher than the speed of your circuit. So, so usually this is an indication as to how, how hard you can push your device in order, to, um, in order to make it work at high speed. Um, what's interesting about this particular slide is that this slide was generated using a 0.13 micron uh, CMOS process. And so we're at GM over ID of 20. We're sort of in the moderate inversion region, and the subthreshold region is out here. And what we see is that at that, you know, in, in, in the, in, in when GM over ID is equal to 20, you have uh, FT of 20 gigahertz. What that means is you can easily build a circuit that operates at two gigahertz. That's pretty fast for, uh, for you know, when, you, when you think about it, when you think about that you're biasing your device in, you know, in a region close to the subthreshold region. If you're, if you're designing um, in the 60 gigahertz circuit, so you probably have to push your devices all, all the way up here in order to, I mean, in order to get enough uh, speed out of, out of your device. This is a really good example because I happened to be working on a similar circuit a couple years ago when I was at IBM. So this is a, um, a subthreshold uh, CMOS receiver, which was not, which is not good enough to be in your cell, uh, in your cell phone, but it has enough performance that it can probably uh, used in a less um, uh, in, in, an, in an application where the, the specs are less stringent. So what I like about this is that they were able to basically use special devices and, and make it work at such uh, high speed. And that's really what, was what I really like about that publication. The noise figure, which is an indication of how, how much the noise is produced by the circuit here, is a little bit high. And this is one reason that it's not good enough to be in a cell phone because in order for this circuit to, to be uh, deploying a cell phone, you have to have a noise figure close to two, two dBs. So if you look at the speed of the circuits that uh, in the publications that I show in the beginning of the talk, EKG, what, what is the speed you need for EKG? 10 hertz to 200, 250 hertz. What is the process used in that publication? 0.5 micron CMOS. Oximeter? It doesn't have to be extremely fast. Probably less, the speed is probably less than 1,000 hertz. The process that was used was 1.5 micron. Don can probably tell us when this process was last used, but I really cannot remember uh, anybody using that pro process now. Um, impedance spectroscopy, only 10 to 50 megahertz. And this was designed in 0.35. My point is that there's quite a bit of things you can do with the free shuttles available from Moses nowadays. And that's, that's, that's a whole area that's opened up to people in academia. Let's talk about gain next. Gain, so what, what I'm plotting here is 
is um, the self gain of a transistor. So what we're, assume, what we're assuming is that you have common source amplifier biased by a current source. Right? So what we're looking at here is the self gain produced by this transistor. The idea is that when you move to a more advanced technology, your self gain actually goes down. And that's the problem that people complain quite a bit when they design in 60 nanometer CMOS. Because when you, when you design it, uh, the gain is basic over here. You're lucky if you can get probably 15, um, um, 15 uh, of, uh, uh, of self gain. And one of the things, one of the things that's nice about working in, in older technologies is that you actually have more self gain, which is kind of nice. But you do have to be more careful because very quickly you find out that you can qu quickly run out of headroom, especially when you try to implement, um, you know, cascode in a low uh, in a low voltage technology. So one thing that some people don't know about analog design is that whereas in the digital world, the you know the the only channel length they will they will ever use is the minimum channel length. But whereas in the analog world, we don't have to live by that rule. So in a way, it doesn't really make sense to, for a lot of analog designers to use a more advanced process. But at the end of the day, it's the digital guys who, des who decide what kind of process the analog, analog designers get to use. So in a sense, we don't have a choice. But we don't have a lot of problem with the self gain because you don't have to use the minimum channel length. And you can always get more gain by using a larger, larger device. Linearity is the next, next item that I would like to hit. Um, this is a really difficult topic to talk about because there is really not a, it, it's extremely difficult to try to capture nonlinear behavior of a circuit. And, and it's quite a bit of a challenge. And that's something that we're currently working on right now. And the reason is this. I'm going to skip, I'm going to follow uh, Professor Kujuri's advice and skip to more pictures as opposed to equations. The reason is this, anytime you want to approximate a nonlinear behavior with a simpler uh, behavior, you need to have as many terms as possible in your approximation. If you try to um, capture this complicated behave, uh, uh, term, uh, this line here, with Taylor approximation, you you need a few terms in order to get it right. Oh, um, so so one of the one of the things we're working on now is to figure out a way to extrapolate small signal parameters. So so there are certain things you can do, right? You you can never really do a good job with large signal uh, large signal nonlinear circuits. But there are certain things you can do so that you can predict uh, the, the nonlinearity in a weakly nonlinear circuit. And the way you can do that is by incorporating some terms from the tail approximations. And, and wh I want to give you an example to show you where linearities can be an important thing. This is the circuit that's taken right out of that biosensor that, um, that I showed earlier, the, the, the impedance sensor that I showed earlier. And, and the reason I, I spent, I was very excited, you know, I was, I really look, look at the, uh, read, the, read this paper very thoroughly. And the reason, it, it, the reason I like this circuit is because it reminds so much of the wireless receiver I used to design, right? You have a, basically an LNA followed by two mixers. And you have essentially the same problems um, in this circuit um, as I had when I designed the, the receiver a couple of years ago. So basically what you have here is a mixer which can limit the linearity of the circuit quite a bit. And, the, and so how does that affect the impedance spectrometry circuit? <coughs> Sorry, that's a typo. This is not the oximeter circuit. So, so the idea is this, right? You're trying to measure your impedance based by applying this excitation voltage source into this chemical solution, and you're trying to get a current out of that, that circuit. 
However, as you, as, as you push more and more current into this circuit, into the input of this circuit, at some point, you start to have large signal behaviors in the mixers, and also at, at um, and less, this is less than the issue here, but you have more, lin uh, the linearity of the circuit becomes a, a problem. So what that means is it limits your ability to measure a wide range of impedance. And that's ultimately what, com what comes down to. So from a dis designer's perspective, perspective, this is a problem that's extremely difficult to, to work with. Because if you think about how, what it takes to produce this curve, right, you basically have to generate enough points on this line in order to get this curve. And, and it's especially when you want to generate, it's especially difficult to generate uh, and time consuming to generate points when you operate in this region. So often this is a very difficult circuit to optimize because you end up spending so much time to, in your simulation and it would be nice to have, to come up with a design strategy that can help speed up the design process. And that's something we're working on right now. The next thing I want to talk about is noise. Um, there, a lot of sources of noises in the electronic world. I talked about uh, the 60 hertz uh, noise from the environment. But if you look at, there t for CMOS, the two uh, primary sources of noises is, are thermal noise and flicker noise. The thermal noise is generated by uh, the noise, uh, the, sources in the, the noise sources in the channel. The flicker noise, on the other hand, is generated by the traps, which live near the interface between the silicon and the silicon dioxide. And they can, they can randomly uh, trap charges and release charges. And what you see when you measure the flicker noise on the oscilloscope is that at very low frequencies, you have this 1 over, one over f um, spectrum. Right? And usually, when you see that, and that's an indication that you have one over noise in your circuit. So how, do, how is that a big problem? Well, it's a big problem for biomedical circuits because if you think about the frequencies that, um, of these circuits, right, none of them really work beyond one kilohertz. So what that means is you have to have a circuit which is relatively free of one over F noise problems. And so a slide over there, it talks about 1 over F corner, which is basically the frequency where the thermal noise is equal to the 1 over F noise. So for this particular EKG circuit, which is not the same as the one that I showed earlier, in this particular application, they're trying to use the circuit to detect the alpha wave. Um, the, the 1 over F noise is extremely difficult to uh, problem is, is extremely difficult problem to solve because you have to have a 1 over f corner frequency of 1 hertz. And that's really difficult because for the, no, for the OTAs I've designed so far, the operational amplifiers I've designed so far, most of them have 1 over f noise around 1 to 2 kilohertz and they're relatively high compared to the circuits here. So really in order to get a circuit that works at this low of a frequency, you have to employ special techniques. Um, this is the this is the um, the impedance sensor circuit, this, uh, and the noise associated with that. So I will spare you of the details, but ultimately for this particular circuit, the scan rate, meaning the rate at which you can sample your um, sample the impedance your, uh, of your sample, depends on how much bandwidth. Uh, you, you, you allow your circuit, uh, your circuit, to, your system to process. The wider the bandwidth, the more noise is going to introduce. Therefore, um, you will, and, and what that also means is that the circuit is a little faster. So you will reduce the, uh, the scan rate, meaning the speed you can process samples, but you will have a, a, a results that are more noisy. So what are we doing currently with any of these circuits? Well, one of the problem, there are several ways to, um, to improve circuits. You can do it at a system level, which is probably the best way to, 
to solve problems. And there are other ways you can solve problems, such as trying to choose a particular topology uh, that optimize the performance of your, of your system. In this, I can give you a few examples. Um, it's usually, this is a good example. Um, they used a, a different circuit. I'm sorry, not this one. They used a different, um, they, they used what a technical cherry, cherry sampling to reduce the, the 1 over F uh, corner frequency. And whereas if you were to use just a regular OTA, like the one here, you will find it difficult to push, uh, push your corner frequency down to one, 1 hertz. Another way to solve the problem is to improve the way you design your circuits. And I think for students, you know, especially for the graduate student, this is probably the, the area where you need a lot of work on. Right? So the problem comes, and the problem is this. In your undergraduate classes, you learn about the square law. Right? And the square law really just applies to devices that operate in a strong inversion region. However, today, if you want to design low power devices, you really, you really want to design your devices in a moderate inversion in the subthreshold region. And that's where, that's where sort of the stuff you, uh, you learn in, at the undergraduate level sort of doesn't work quite well so, anymore. And it's not, and you really cannot improve your hand calc, you know, the accuracy of your hand calculations by you know, using a more complicated models. I think this past Monday we just covered short channel device mo uh, model for MOS transistor in my graduate class, right? Even, that, even with that particular uh, model, you really, st you still don't, can't capture the behavior over here. So, so what you really need is a flexible design strategy that helps you to sort of optimize your circuits several parameters at a time. And the way you can do that is not necessarily with more simulation, right? Because as you can see with the linearity problems that I showed before, it's extremely time consuming to, uh, to throw your problems at the circuit simulator and ask this, the circuit simulator to solve the problems for you. So what we want to do is to have um, a, 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 a strategy that I call the GM over I base strategy, which allows you to use all regions of operations and which can speed up the design by minimizing the time that you actually have to spend using the simulator. So, so far we've been working on, on this particular strategy, which is this, I think of it as a semi-empirical semi uh, technique, in the sense that when you first get the process from the foundry, you spend about a day running this script, which captures all the, the behavior of the transistors in this file. And once you have all that behavior, uh, be behavior uh, characteristic in, in this file, you simply uh, use the data from this file in your design. So, so, so far we've done quite a bit of work with that. And at this point, I feel we have a pretty good handle on how to minimize power and you know, get as much speed and how to, how to you know, do tra good trade-offs reasonable trade-off between noise and gain, but I think what we need a little bit of work is in the area of linearity and mismatch. So, so I'm gonna skip the following slides. Basically, so, so the idea is that when you start a design, when you start designing a circuit, right, you have to have a very clear understanding as to what are, what are the fundamental limitations of the process you're using? How does that tie to the circuit you're a particular circuit that you're designing. So, so the way you can do that is by doing quite a bit of analysis in the beginning, which is something that you learn from schools, uh, from the classes you take, at the, you know, either at the undergraduate level at the, or at the, at the graduate level. And once you're able to have these analytical calculations, then you can pull in information from the database and relay that and get realistic behaviors. So there are several projects we're working on right now. So we're so far, we've we finished uh, working on the noise problem, and the next problem we, we want to move on to is linearity, which will involve doing a little bit of Taylor series expansion and trying to uh, extrapolate that, incorporate that in 
in the database. Next, we want to do something about mismatch. This is extremely difficult to work on because um, it involves running quite a bit of simulations. Also, your model has to be really good. Excuse me, the mismatch is the impedance mismatch? No, oh, sorry, this is the mismatch of the transistors. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so anytime, you know, let's say you have two transistors, you draw them next to each other. Yeah. When, you f when you make them through the, uh, through the foundries, they actually don't come out identical. So, so what, th what that effectively means to you as a designer is that uh, if you're trying to implement, let's say, a current source, a current mirror, for example, yeah, yeah. the current will not be exactly matched. So several things we want to do. So, so far, we have this sort of foundation for GMO variety uh, analysis. I, I really want to apply it to a couple of building blocks that I used to work on. And I've tried it with uh, LC Tank oscillator when I was work, working on IB a couple of years ago. It worked really well. Um, and I'd like to extend that to mixers and low noise amplifier. And I think it will be extremely interesting to extend the, the noise analysis to mixers because that's something that I particularly had trouble with a couple years ago in terms of trying to optimize, uh, optimizing its performance. The linearity is, is pretty difficult, especially with mixers. And I tried that a few years ago without a lot of success. But I think I want, I'm, ready, I'm ready to try it with the, the methodology that we develop, we can develop. So there are also a few projects that are not at, uh, that, that's not as fundamental in the sense. And the first project involves building a low power um, oscillator, which can serve, which can be used as a, um, as a simple uh, uh, FM transmitter. So in this case, you try to put this chip on the, on the back of uh, a small animal, right? And, and the, the idea is that what you see out here is a battery, and the chip is actually a small portion of what you see here. The idea is that it's extremely, if this circuit is to work, then your chip has to be extremely low power. And, and, and ultimately it comes down to how you design this oscillator. And part of it has to do with a power amplifier as well. But the idea is that Usually, in order to design a good oscillator, you, you, you need to burn more power to reduce the effect of noise. But, you know, when you have to put this circuit on the back of an animal, then it's a little bit difficult. So are there ways we can design the circuit a little better so it can be more low power? I'm also quite interested in uh, the impedance spectro uh, spectroscopy circuit because um, it just looks so much like the circuit I used to design. And and I like to see if I can sort of, there are certain things I skipped before. For example, I skipped a slide about uh, this particular, I, I really didn't comment too much about this particular slide. And so in this, and the reason, so in this particular, uh, if I may, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just finish this in 30 seconds. You're not supposed to have as much at one over F noise because what you're using there is, you're using a direction conversion technique, which, Basically, theoretically, you should get rid of your 1 over F noise completely. But the reason you're seeing the 1 F, F over F noise here is because you have mixers which are not really, which are affected by the, the, the one, over, 1 over F noise, which means, so when you try to sample that noise, it produces noise at very low frequencies, and that's why you see out here. So, so the conclusion I would like to draw for today's talk is that looking at the literatures about what's going on in the, bi in the biomedical field, it reminds me of what goes on in the wireless field probably uh, 10 years ago. You know, back then, you, you know, you, I, you, I, sub I subscribed to this journal called Journal of Solid State Circuits. You know, with, if you look at this, the, the, the so the publications from, from 10 years ago, there was quite a bit of activities in the wireless arena. You know, people figure out different ways to design LNA mixers, different receivers, and there's all kinds of activities going on. And somehow, you don't see a lot of that happening right now. I think part of it is because th there, my, my biased view of this is that there are only a few big players who can afford to remain playing in this game, right? If you think about, how much effort it goes into producing, you know, 
this integrated chip with, which all has all the cell phone standards. Very few companies can afford to do that. And very few people in the academic world can afford to do that. And what people have realized over the years is that, you know, there are other things we can do. Why not, you know, instead of trying to compete with Qualcomm's and Broadcom's, why not try to shift our focus a little bit, try to work on biomedical circuits. And that's what I see quite a bit. You know, I see really see that flurry of activities going on in the biomedical uh, world right now, right now. And I think part of it is driven by sort of the maturity of process. You can do that with, uh, with a relatively inexpensive process. Another reason for that is the timing is right. You have a bunch of people. You have a significant portion uh, of the population in this country that are re retiring. So now more and more there's this emphasis is on how, what do we need to do in order to reduce the cost of healthcare. And, and, and people are beginning to realize that, you know, the, a lot of the equipments we use in the hospitals are archaic. You know, there really are better ways of, uh, of doing things. And I think that's, that's where the electrical engineers can offer their assistance in this, in this, in this area. So that's where I also see a lot of opportunities in the future. So that concludes my talk. Okay. Uh.